Welcome back to In The House Podcast. We are here today with Kelly Hager of Spark, a real estate software for selling new homes and condos. I wanted to, before we jump into Spark, I wanted to just give you a background about how I kind of like connected with you because yeah, I love that <laughs> <laughs> because it kind of comes in full circle there's like a few touch points cool um because you're because you're involved in so many things um uh your involvement with the UDI so I wanted to talk about that because uh I'm a member Let's of that talk about that <laughs> what a great industry yeah I'm a member of that and you actually host the book club like are you the the leader of the book club well, where it's a collaborative approach over there. Um, I'm on the but women's board. Yes. Okay. So I've, um, I got passed the torch by, uh, Casey and a bunch of other great women, Susanna. Um, really the women of urban development is a subsidiary board of the urban development Institute, which has a really big stronghold here out West. And you bring it up in Toronto and people are like, what? Yeah. Like, bless you. Like what? Ha-? And I'm like, no, they're like, urban land Institute out there is, is the big one. We okay. have that here as well. Right. Um, but yeah, the Urban Development Institute is a great organization for networking and bringing really t- um, to the head of, of a lot of uh, developers and, you know, current events and what's happening regarding policies and how do we push new initiatives. Um, and I took on the book club because I just loved attending it. It was such like a safe space to just be open and raw and have these more intimate conversations. A lot of the time, it's not even about the book. Uh, it's a lot of the time just about connecting about women. Mm-hmm. In Personal the industry, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Um, you also also host the cycling club too. Like you're part of that leader. Yeah. So we've just <laughs> we've just yeah. I'm, you're you're doing your homework. Um, well, we, I did sign up for next week, and then awesome. I canceled. Oh, <laughs> because we have a heart. team event. No, no, no it's because we have a team event. But I will promise. I okay. Well, there's to the there's going to be more. Yeah, we've been, it was kind of a brainchild of mine for a while, thinking, okay, well, how can we network and how can we get women more into other fields that um, potentially can open up that networking. Um, and I, I was like, what about cycling? And, you know, you, I did the Grand Fondo on a whim last summer, and it was great. I loved it. Um, I'm not a cyclist by any means, but I'm more, I go for the end and the celebratory drinks at the end of it. I think awesome. that's the, you know, the goal. Yeah. Um, but during it, I found out that I really love it, and it's a lot of fun. And I think a lot of people in general get scared of things that they're unaware of. And um I got scared of that hill. I had to bike up in Stanley Park the other night. And that was my first time going one. up the hill because I took the one. detour and I did not realize there was a big hill. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, for me, it's just, uh, I always say like the just keep swimming, just one foot at a time. And then before you know it, you're at the top. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, we started that. Um, I think UDI took it on as well. So they've done a few networking events now cycling and it was great. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of fun, a great way to, during this COVID era to get out, get some exercise mm-hmm. and meet other people in the industry. Yeah, I'm finding that a lot of um, like golf uh, events are canceled and everything. So I'm glad that that's still going. Yeah, it's something you can do um, individually, but collectively, which is yeah. nice. Yeah, and your involvement with UDI, what have you learned over the, over, like, were you serving on the committee from 2019, like, since last year? Two years. So um, I'm not a barnacle yet. We joke that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, if you're constantly uh, partaking and and advocating for it, you might get that that well-esteemed stature of uh, of barnacle (laughs) status. Um, No, it's uh, it's a great community. The women there are super powerful and just all in the right ways, like, so encouraging and... Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, just build you up. Um, Mm -hmm. I got involved through Virginia Bird of Pottinger Bird, and she said, you'd be great. Like, just go for it. Um, I put my name in the hat, and I guess they liked me. So that was um, in 2018 now, so two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two years ago. And now with COVID, uh, we haven't been able to facilitate the next round of um, applicants quite yet. So I guess I'm somewhat a barnacle. (laughs) A start of it. Um, I lo- a lot of people don't know what UDI is. It's the Urban Development Institute. Yes. And any real estate professional can actually sign up. You just have to pay the membership fee, right? Exactly. Okay. And even if you're not a member, it's just a higher fee to go to any of the events. And right. during COVID, they've done a lot of free events. So mm-hmm. um, even like UBC students, um, SFU, we've we've noticed a lot of uh, people just partaking online. And um, the the book club, we took it online. It was definitely experimental, but um, I think it went, it went okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was fantastic. Um, so yeah, going back to Spark, um, you're working in two of the hottest sectors in Vancouver, 
tech and real estate. Great combination, right? Yeah. It's really well infused. Um, I have a few client developers who have adopted Spark into part of their sales process, and it certainly makes purchasing real estate much, much, much easier. Um, it combines real estate leads and inventory management and into like one super clean, like intuitive system. So you I'm gonna it. I'm gonna let you <laughs> explain it a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. Um, it was yeah. It, you 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 hit the nail on the head there, Jenny. It's really merging tech and real estate together in an intuitive fashion. Um, it came out of a frustration in the marketplace, and it was really started by our CEO, our CTO, and our COO. Um, they just saw that it could be done better. At first, it was a CRM. It really morphed from there into a contract management. What year aspect. did that start? That started uh, ooh, back in 2016, okay. the, the building blocks of it. So we've been in it for a very long time. We're actually the first new development real estate platform to integrate with DocuSign. So okay. timestamp, date stamp, location stamp, a juggernaut in the industry. Um, we're legally binding globally. So we have clients across North America that, especially during this COVID era, that have really embraced it. And, um, you know, we're not just a flavor of the month. We're your backbone. So like you said, we do everything from the lead capturing, inventory management, all the way up to the contract generation and custom reporting. And during this time, we're seeing a lot of people, you know, kind of try to come into that digital contract space that maybe haven't thought it out as well. Mm -hmm. If we build something, we build a property and we definitely approach it with like an ingenuitive um, aspect. And mm -hmm. because we have experience, bit of a background on myself, I cut my teeth many years ago with Ani. Um, all of our, all of my colleagues um, on the sales and the customer success side of things have worked in the industry. So we've definitely have a big, a big plethora of experience of, you know, what to do and what not to do. Absolutely. And do you recall what CRM you were using with Ani? Oh yeah. I will not disclose. <laughs> um, hey, they had a system, right? That's, that's the first, uh, first, first point. A lot of developers yeah. that we work with are still using Excel. So as long as you have a system oh, yes. in place is great. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you want something that's going to work for you. And I think you, you also alluded to, um, just an intuitive platform. Like mm -hmm. we focus so much on design, it, really your tools are only going to be as good as the people that are using it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have an intuitive system, they're not going to use it. But what we have noticed with, you know, this new era that we're coming into with COVID, um, there are a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of, uh, developers and project marketers. We work with all sorts of, um, people in the industry, not just developers, if you're a brokerage team and you take on a section of new development, we can be your backbone for that. We'll be the one-stop one shop to help you power the transaction, mm -hmm. lead management, email marketing, custom reporting that you mm -hmm. can then report back to the developer. Um, and we work with project marketing teams um, here locally and abroad. And really, at the end of the day, what we've noticed is a lot of developers are, are re-evaluating re, re what really what, what, where their values are, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why are... Where do we want to put our time and effort and where do we see the most return? And so we've had a lot of people that have, you know, even built out their own system and now they're reevaluating it and saying, hey, maybe we should go with Spark because right. they're 90% there for the industry. The other 10% we want to work, we'll work with you to customize it. Yeah. Why did the owners decide to um, focus on like new developments rather than it's what we resale? Knew. It's what we knew. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing really out there at the time like that. So we knew it was a niche market that if we did it properly, we could hit it well. And we're now in eight countries. We've transacted uh, over a hundred billion dollars worth of real estate transactions for new developers. Well, we've, uh, that was my next question is where are you guys, um, where are your clients mainly located? Yeah. I mean, uh, our last market that we've really broken into more recently over the last five years is Toronto. Um, and that's partly, it's just such gangbusters there. It is a bit of a different beast. Um, but we have noticed and we have brought on a lot of clients, um, within the GTA, you know, teams like Minto, Milbourne, um, Metropia, um, it's been a really, it's been a really fun thing to do, but it's mm -hmm. also just a different beast. Like they don't treat leads the same I as we do out here. I would love to hear. Yeah. Because I would love to hear how the leads are treated. I know that in the States it's, it's like follow-up calls, follow-up calls. It's like very, very bold and, uh, assertive on, on the phone versus we kind of take like, a, I kind of feel like Canadians or maybe Vancouverites were so used to this launch and, and it's like, 70% sold, 80% sold. So we tend to take a step back on the follow-ups. Um, I don't know if that's what you see, but I've kind of kind of get that feeling. And just through other coaching, um, coaching coaches that I've talked to, that's what they also notice. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's very situational, right? And, uh, 
we're seeing it now more than ever. I think the human connection is super important. There's all this emphasis on like tech and, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, digital online buying through some sort of, you know, sales center. I think there's an element of that that will always, we we are moving towards. Um, but at the end of the day, that human connection, pick up the phone and just talk to them. For me, at mm. least, my own experience, I know that um, that empathy and the human connection, people are craving it more than ever mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that Toronto, the GTA area, was a little bit different. So can you describe like yeah. West Coast versus East Coast? Yeah, it's more like a, a, a co-brokerage. So it's a lot of people don't really nurture the leads as well. Um, I find that what we've noticed and even having lived in Toronto for a few years myself, it's a lot more, um, you know, just buy, buy, buy. We need to get the deal done. They don't really focus on the nurturing of a lead. Okay. Whereas out here, I actually think we do a good job of that. I think a lot of people um, maybe follow their gut a bit more when it comes to it. Um, I don't think there's a formula per se mm -hmm. to like, you know, 10 touch points and that'll convert the lead. Um, the way I look at it, like sales is great. Everyone does sales, you know, whether you're selling your ideas, yourself, um, you know, your your product. Um, I fought it for a long time and I mean, like put up your hand, like, you know, like who, I mean, there's not many of us in this room, but who here likes to talk to salespeople, right? Tell us where to call or a 1-800 number, chances are you're not going to pick up the phone. So uh, there's a lot of resources out there um, for you to utilize and like it was never taught in school So I really took it upon myself when I was at Ani to just learn like be a sponge like I grew up with two older brothers They're awesome. Um, I grew up in Vancouver. I realized how like lucky we are to be from Vancouver But at the end of the day like you need to utilize the tools that you have and I think I mentioned my brothers because they pushed me, you know, and when I was little, it was like, I'm going to do whatever you do, but I'm going to do it better. And that's the true, true to anything, right? If you come in with that mentality, um, you can definitely, uh, I think, approach things from a logical standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I think you get the information that you need. There's a lot of resources out there. A sales guru of mine, David Premier out of Toronto, he used to be the head of Salesforce, uh, managed a lot of teams. He has some great resources through mm -hmm. cerebral selling. Um Simple methods like KISS, keep it simple, stupid, totally. you know, yeah. like no one wants to get an email that's like 20 paragraphs of you explaining how great you are, how great the product is. Yeah. Just be genuine. And no one wants that phone call of like, hi, you know, it's me, you know, like, uh, just be, be real. Uh, yeah. Especially right now in COVID, I think people are, are wanting that more and more. Um, another one like Biff, brief, informative, friendly and focused or firm. Um, there's ways that you can get your point across, uh, less is more through, through an email aspect of it. Yeah. Um, these are awesome tips, by the way. <laughs> I hope you guys are taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, like I did my research, you know, like I've done many years of just reading and even like historically, like mm -hmm. what, what is going up in our city, the city of glass, you know, um, is completely different than what Toronto is doing, mm -hmm. which is just like development on steroids. I think there's more cranes per capita in that city than anywhere in North America. Mm -hmm. Um, which is completely different than the clients we work with in Cambodia, you know, or the clients that we're working with in Dubai. Like right. uh, an option and upgrade in Dubai is completely different than what we have here. So, yeah, what do you see the big, biggest difference in terms of build urban planning and, and buildings? I think, I thought, again, it's so situational. Um, Europe has a different city model, right? Everything was kind of built around the church and different types of interactions in the day than, than what North America was built off of, which was the American dream and expansion and cul-de-sacs. And um, yeah, I, I think what we're seeing here now is is a more focus on um, smarter design. So mm -hmm. utilizing technology in developments. Um, we're seeing a lot of developers, you know, smart touch this, Alexa this, and they're utilizing technology and they're starting to come around to it, which, by the way, is probably the slowest industry to do so. Um, I kind of feel that way too. Like oh, yeah. It's the adoption very archaic. Is, is really behind. Yeah, but we're starting to see that now more. And, um, you know, with a system like Spark, it's so industry specific. Uh, we are the full scope of conception to completion. And as I'm saying, like teams are now starting to see that. So how can we leverage that data to make more intuitive mm -hmm. cities? Mm -hmm. How can we leverage that data to make a better floor plan, mm -hmm. right? What are, we're in this massive discovery phase of like information overload. You have, you know, Buzz Buzz Home, Off Plan, Avesdo. You have so many tech companies that are coming into this space now. And you're really starting to, to realize 
who those big players are and who are the teams that are really going to get you to where you need to go right. and those that just might be the flavor of the month. Um, with something like like Spark, we're seeing a lot of developers really take the reins of that data and mm -hmm. understanding that, hey, we have a, a process where we can understand what people, not only what they're looking for, what type of uh, unit mix they want. We have a whole database of people through our port, our company portfolio that right. they can utilize, a developer can utilize and say, hey, well, not only do we have a group of people that missed out the first time around, we now also know what they're looking for. Exactly. So and that, especially in this time of day where with the pandemic and everybody's now confined to their space inside, um, like analyzing how people live in the home is going to be really important moving forward. Yeah, 100%. And I think, again, that discovery, we're in this, you know, there's a lot of information overload out there. The whole like single cookie tracking, I personally look at it as a false hug. Um, maybe that's a bad analogy right now, <laughs> given that it's COVID and people are probably missing hugs. Um, but um, for myself, you know, it's 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 really more reactive than proactive. If like the, the best thing I can hammer home for anyone that's listening to this that is wanting to take on new development as a broker or is working with the brokerage team, have that process in place or a developer, you know, make sure your team's properly trained, have the support system there that's there to do that. Um, our customer success team is awesome. They like knock it out of the park day in, day out, making sure that not only are developers' processes seamless, but they also make sure that it's very unique to their process. They figure it out. It's a lot of handholding. And I think we're seeing that a lot also with your outreach now, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot more handholding going on. People want that human connection. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned the false hug because something like like single cookie tracking, it's only a small section of what the actual outreach is. I'd rather, when I was in the industry, have a process in place and make sure that the team followed it, you know, mm -hmm. like a tight ship, so to right. say, rather than, and if there's a bit of a big brother aspect too, like if you're looking on a website, do you really want someone calling you five minutes later being like, hey, I noticed that you, you know, or exactly. like, so. Exactly, yeah. yeah. No, I, um, I want to bring it back to, um, having a plan. So the users for this CRM, um, and the, the whole point of having the CRM is keeping the leads clear and organized and being able to create in-depth reports, uh, to analyze like traffic and sales. Um, and like you said, build better homes and, and having that connection. What are, what are buyers looking for? What are they er yearning for? Um, Take us through what a real estate agent or a salesperson would do uh, online once a cold lead registers okay, yep. onto from a website and it go gets batched into the the Spark CRM. Um, take us through a lead qualifi qualification plan, um, either email or phone or combination of both. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. Um, Again, very situational, depends on the product that you're selling, but there are a few standards that are no-brainers. So you should have a system in place that automatically sends out an email. As soon as that registrant comes in, an email should go out. And ideally, you have a system that monitors and, and uh, understands duplicates so that it can merge it together so you're not doubling or tripling down on your outreach mm -hmm. for one individual. No one likes that, right? I've been there where maybe my Wi-Fi was lagging. The last thing I want is four of the same emails being like, welcome to the looks are, you know, and you're just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just keep it tight. Um, yeah. Uh, initial touch point is mandatory from there. I typically in the past and what I do now is call them. You know, if someone's registered, they're giving you full carte blanche to give them a call, give them a call. If they don't pick up, uh, leave a message, um, let them know that you've reached out. Um, keep it simple. Again, the best selling is not selling conversational, I think is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Um, have your information, know your points. Um, and then from there, you know, your marketing team, if you have one, should probably have a system in place for a drip campaign or like an email campaign to go out. Um, whether it's like a templated, curated email, we can do that with Spark, which is great. So we do have a system very similar to Constant Contact or MailChimp, mm -hmm. you know, probably from using it, mm -hmm. drag and drop imaging, very easy to, to create this the content. Um, but yeah, you should have some sort of email aspect or, or at least a follow-up schedule uh, in place. And then it's just about using a system and having it implemented because at the end of the day, you want to focus on selling and whatever that conversion is or what your goals are. Um, you're not going to, if you don't have something in place, you're not going to be able to have the time to really focus on 
what you're good at, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of tools out there that can really help alleviate the time and the management aspect of it. Yeah, no, it's a great, uh, great tool for sure, because it almost is uh, like a, t a time saver, like scalable, it's robust, and it's working while you're sleeping. Um, what are some uh, top, give us some like five top email tips um, yeah, follow-up tips yeah. that you can give to our listeners. No exclamations in, okay. uh, in subject matter. That'll spark spam. Um, you know, I think... Can it, I ask one question? Yeah. What if we wrote, re, like, RE, colon, regarding, as if it was a follow-up email? I know that, that trick. Really isn't. I know that <laughs> trick. I think just, again, be genuine, right? Okay. Be genuine. I, I get the RE, and, like, sometimes it'll, like, spook, like, I'll get it in my inbox, because, like, we have clients trying to get you know, trying to work with us as well. And I'll get like a re email. I'm like, oh no, did I forget something? And I'll like, go in. I'm like, oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> um, just be genuine. I think um, empathy is a big one. And I, I know I mentioned and I alluded to David Premier earlier, but um, he really focuses on that. And this is prior to COVID. I think being genuine and, and having an empathetic understanding of what the client's looking for, and you'll know pretty quickly if they're a qualified buyer or not, mm -hmm. you know, trust that gut. Mm -hmm. um, it won't usually steer you wrong. And if they're just a person kicking tires, it's not worth it. You know, yeah. you had your touch point, move on to a more qualified lead, have a rating system, uh, super important. Um, but back to your question about, about emails. Yeah. Keep it simple. Um, you know, simple subject header to the point, uh, brief, friendly, um, and then the click rate and conversion. I mean, these are data, data analytics that are more for like a marketing team to really understand what content is hitting better than others. But if you're a sales agent, just trying to do outreach, Keep it to the point. Try to get them on the phone. That's my main, like, so much can get lost in text or yeah. email that just doesn't get conveyed in a tone yeah, or absolutely. timing. Yeah, Communication. So I do want to touch on one thing about numbers because I feel like that's the hardest for me to understand is the conversion rates um, and how it's measured. So like what is a successful email open rate? Um, tips on how to improve on the closing ratios and what that yeah. what a what a successful closing ratio is. Um, I'm I'm kind of like fly by this fly by this fly by this the seat, seat of, of your, your pants. pants. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Um, where you know get as much response as possible, and then the next week, like let's get another email out without really yeah. evaluating with, what the success plan I think, is. I think I mean. A very successful email open rate would be anywhere from like 80% up. Keep in mind that you're going to have probably, if you're, it depends on your database. A lot of people change email. A lot of people will have spam file folders going. So there are things like no exclamation marks, no bolds, no mm -hmm. underlines in the subject matter that can automatically spike and flag uh, spam. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, though, is based on your email server provider's security uh, backend. Um our system, Spark, uses something called uh, Mailgun, which ensures for proper receivership. If you're doing it from like Gmail or something, don't send a big mass email out to a bunch of people because the load of it or the the size of it can also spark, mm -hmm. um, pun intended. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, conversion rates. Again, I, I if you're an individual agent, I think just focus on talking with your sale, with your marketing team about um, you know what can I do and and kind of use the team that you have. Um, of to how to better create, uh, you know, collaboration and synergy, I think is something we're really missing right now in the COVID era with people working from home. But there mm -hmm. is an element of that, that lean on that, you know, use something like Slack, like use something that you can communicate with your team still, text messages, something, right, to, mm -hmm. to help with it. Um, our team, like, we often take a very collaborative approach uh, when it comes to outreach. And it's like, more set of eyes, I'm all for it, right? Yeah. There's something that you might miss that others wouldn't. Um, but regarding open rate and like click rate is probably a more accurate uh, portrait, I would say. Open rate's one thing, but if you actually get the clicks on it, I would then go and take that segment of people that clicked um, and create another follow-up email campaign to send out to them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good tips. Um, I know your emphasis is is really on verbal communication and phone calls and picking up yeah, the phone. Yeah, I'm, I'm old school. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I appreciate, actually. The texting can get like almost too much. Um, can you give us some tips on what kind of topics to kind of bring up with when you're calling a, a lead and you've had a few follow-up phone calls and, and 
you're trying to trying to figure out like where they're at in their decision making. What kind of questions can you really ask to get to the point of whether or not they're going to be yeah buying? Yeah, I think there's like a few key indicators there, right? Like you have to know are all the party decision makers involved? Mm-hmm. Is it within their budget? Um, is it timing? You know, timing's a big one right now. We're looking at historically rate low interest rates and mortgage rates, Mm -hmm. but we also are going through a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with people that are over leveraged more than we've ever seen, I think, historically. Um, I think there's like a report or article that came out, I think, two years ago that said the average Vancouverite is living month to month within $200 of their budget. Wow. Being in over their head. Struggle is real. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so I think... um, you need to ask those questions, but you need to do it in a, in a, again, I go back to genuine manner. And I think that it kind of comes back to tone. And there's certain pieces of information you're going to get out from a face-to-face interaction or a phone call that you wouldn't be able to get out via email or text. I guess if they're living with uh, $200 um, remaining, they wouldn't be buying a property anyways. Well, these are people that maybe yeah, already have a home and they're looking at maybe downsizing or selling, right? The yeah. old golden goose egg for all the... Baby boomers on the yeah. West End. I know my parents are one of them. Um, yeah, it's an interesting time that we're that we're trying to navigate here. And I, I really do think um, we can leverage technology going forward in this time. And I think that there's been a lot of teams that have been been doing so. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's going to be more a hybrid model. You know, mm-hmm. you mentioned email, you mentioned text. We've had teams mention like you know WhatsApp or WeChat. And I think at the end of the day, um, it's having a good process in place, having that backbone. Um, a system that works for you. There's going to be gimmicks that will come and go. But I really do think that that human aspect will really shine through more than ever. Um, you know, the in pre-construction, which is what we focus on and what my experience is, you know, I can only speak to what I know and what I know. I don't know much, <laughs> but what I know, I know. And, um, you know, in pre-construction, um, People want to touch and feel, and that's always been the case, Mm -hmm. yet we're trying to provide a product that they can't really touch Mm -hmm. and feel. Mm -hmm. So how are we utilizing technology, whether it's the digital sales center? You know, Mm -hmm. you're seeing teams in the States. You mentioned leads earlier. Like we noticed in Toronto, it's a lot more transactional. Here we like really nurture leads. We try to come up with a process. In like New York, Chicago, they like in the day they would like buy cars and take them out and really, you know, really luxurious builds. Right. You're, like you're, full you're working. Yeah. You're hand yeah. holding. It's a white glove experience. They yeah. want to make you feel special. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think we're going to be seeing, you know, um, we're going to be seeing a hybrid of it. I think you're going to be getting a lot of local downsizers that are still wanting that touch and feel, um, that want that human connection. Mm-hmm. I don't think the salesperson's going anywhere. You know, mm-hmm. anyone that's saying that you can buy a full home online and we need to get rid of that sales rep. Uh, I think they're, they're missing the point. Yeah, you may know a little bit more because you're in touch with more developers, but has there been any much sales or at, at all just online, like uh, without actually meeting a salesperson or going into a presentation center? Have you heard of many deals uh, happening that way? I, I think you're still going to be meeting someone, whether it's an agent or a sales rep, um, but there is a lot more now being done digitally. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot more tech providers out there. Um, there's a lot more services, whether it's, you know, a deal sheet or the actual digital transaction, but the actual buying of a home, you're going to still have the banks involved. You're still going to have that. It's a big purchase. You know, Mm -hmm. you're going to still want that human connection. There's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. With a lot of people involved to get that deal done. Yeah. And I think that the sales center will be there. I think it might just be a, a hybrid, like I was saying, a more modified, um, we're seeing teams using applications that, you know, you can go onto a website of, mm-hmm. of the development and you can have like a digital sales center walkthrough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, you're probably going to pick up the phone and want to actually be really engaged. Yeah. So what we've actually seen more than ever is, is we've been busy. We've been very busy because we've, we've had these teams reassess mm-hmm. what's happening in their market and, mm-hmm. and putting an emphasis and value on tech, something mm-hmm. that they, you know, didn't really do in the past. It mm-hmm. was like marketing, sure. Or the logo, sure. Or, you know, the website will, will put money in that. But now they're saying, okay, well, this data is really important Absolutely. and what we do with it is really important. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised they are not seeing it as a long-term investment because if they want to continue building and if they want to continue selling, um, capturing leads is probably the largest asset you can have. Oh, yeah. Right? And and having a process in place to, for, for proper outreach totally. and then the custom reporting, right? And yeah. knowing what's moving and what's not. And yeah. again, being able to leverage that. Uh, 
we've had a lot of teams using our digital transaction portal more okay. than ever. So being able, like you were saying, can you buy it on online? Mm-hmm. Um, using the DocuSign. Yeah, the DocuSign oh, integration, yeah. um, mm-hmm. kind of a one-stop shop. You're not having two systems trying to communicate. There's no information breakdown. Right. There's no manual errors. Um, and again, new development historically being quite slow traditionally to adapt to it. We're now seeing a lot of developers going, okay, well, actually there is something here. Mm-hmm. And how can we how can we utilize this? Mm-hmm. So, question about the the technology and the software. Um, if I was to send an email from my phone, is that connected to the Sparks? Um, yeah, it can be. Email so system? we're building out an in system email component right now. Mm-hmm. We do have the ability to send out email campaigns, mm-hmm. but an email sync is something that our team is working on. Some teams don't like that though. So what we do is we just BCC. And because one lead could potentially be registered for more than one project, it's a bit of a trickier build to do than mm-hmm. than most people think. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't want, we don't want your whole inbox also being shown right. on, right? That's something that for privacy reasons or you don't want the communication for Sally Smith to show up on ABC right. Build who also registered for XYZ. You don't want the cross-fertilization. Yeah, I, I do remember when we signed up for one CRM, which was I think uh, produced in Illinois or something like that, where... We were, it was, it was, it was capable, it was capable of us sending a text through our phone, but then, and then connected and logged it onto the CRM. However, the text, the outgoing text num- phone number was like some random phone number. It wasn't like a personal 604-778 number. Yeah. And so that already uh, would make it look like it's a spam text. Yeah. Right. So. And that's it, right? It was, you have, you have to kind of be careful, I think, with these. I like to call them flavor of the months because every developer, every project marketer, every sales rep is going to think of something different that they really need and it's mandatory to have mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, like email, phone, phone call, call. <laughs> yeah, okay. proper reporting, okay. proper lead capturing. Okay. It doesn't have to be as complicated as you want it to be. And I think just digital transaction as well is is, is, is pretty huge. Mm-hmm. Um, um I know it's important to make outbound calls and some people don't want to pick up the phone because they're either super shy, they're, they just like calling on the phone now because texting is so much easier. They can hide behind the phone because they don't want to be, um, they feel like they're going to be uh, rejected. So what steps should a salesperson take in order to get into the habit of making phone calls to their leads? You're going to laugh, but when I first started at Ani, um, when I first cut my teeth, many moons ago <laughs> i would practice in front of the mirror okay and like i have a you know musical theater background so i'm shy probably isn't something that most people describe me um as but um for someone that is just practice like i know we said when we first started i'm like does that, that how my voice really sounds <laughs> um you know the more you hear it the better you sound and the better you get at it um know your information utilize the tools that you have do some research there's some great books out there you know Josh Kaufman, personal MBA, anything by David Premier. I can't stress him enough. I should like his little cheerleader over here, but he's great. We're uh, going to mention him in the episode notes. No, don't worry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think um, know your product. So do your research. I think at Ani, when I was there, like the top sales rep, she was a complete shark and she knew the amendment back and forth, mm-hmm. disclosure statement back and forth. Like you'd ask her any question. She if she didn't know the answer, she'd admit it. But if she knew it, she would just, you know. Okay. Yeah. So know know your stuff. Yeah. Um, and just pick up the phone. Yeah. Like, there's no way you're going to get better at it. Yeah. Neither just doing it. Yeah. Exactly. Um. Okay. So, I find that often the CRMs there's just so many tools and and tabs on there. What is the most underutilized tool that you feel I like say- most people need more training on? I would just, uh, and you're going to laugh at this, I'd say whatever your provider is, call up for support and you'll know really quickly mm, okay. if they're going to, one, what their what their return time is, right? Yeah. How quickly are they responding to you? Is their support team, do, do they know what your process looks like? Utilize the tools you have. You know, any software provider should have a good customer success team. Right. And if they have that and if you don't know what to do, they'll help you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a good indicator also of how committed they are to you as a company at how quickly they respond and, and how concise their response is. Mm, that makes me a question that I should re-look at this current CRM that we're using on the resale side. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I 
feel like I'm signed on to every single CRM because I work with so many different developers and us as a team, we're learning you're, each one of them. You're a jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, but I don't know every single one like inside and out. So that's the problem is like every system has its strengths. Um, and then every, and even with the dynamics of my business, I feel like we need certain tools and then we don't need certain tools on other projects. So yeah, and I, I think um, there's certain aspects that you're going to utilize more and depending on where you sit in the project, depending on where you sit in the company, um, knowing what those strengths are within the system and being able to utilize it properly. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's things in Spark, for instance, that sales reps just won't be touching. So there's different permission levels in there. They don't even, they won't even mm-hmm. be able to see it. Exactly. Um, but when it comes to like, okay, I don't know how to do this, just email them. And if they don't respond... One, it's an indicator that maybe you should, you know, send them an email being mm-hmm. like, hey, like I messaged you about this, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, and two, um, you know, a system should be intuitive. We have a lot of teams that went like the custom build out your own and now they're coming back and opening into negotiations with us again. And it's building part- out your own is actually very, very expensive. Well, it's, oh, co- not only does it cost an arm and a leg, you soon find out that it still doesn't do everything right. that you want it to do. And look, there's no system out there that's going to do everything you want it to do, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone's so different. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are systems out there that are more intuitive, mm-hmm. that have a good support group and team, and that have a lot of uh, you know knowledge in the industry. Mm-hmm. So I think I think lean on that. Okay. Um, what changes have you seen in the market? on a global scale since the pandemic? Oh, that's a good one. It's so, um, it's so hyper local in a lot of ways. We just brought on the largest project marketing team in Washington, DC, and right in the thick of, you know, Black Lives Matter, political unrest, a pandemic, they can't keep inventory on the shelf. Right. Which is crazy. You'd think like logically you'd be like, oh, it'd be the opposite. Exactly. It isn't. So they were like, we need a system that will work. They were looking, you know, the Salesforce route, they were looking at building and they were like, no, it's, it's not worth it. Um, and they were really excited and, they're, and they are excited and they have been to utilize Spark. Because um, you guys are Vancouver based. So how does the word get out to to like other countries and picking up the phone? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> no, so you have a dedicated like we do, yeah. outreach team. Yeah, okay. yeah. There's we have an amazing sales team. Um, Jessica and myself and Davina, David and Jeff and Simeon. Um, they all work their butt off. And even prior to that, we've um, yeah, we've just done a good. A lot of it was like naturally, organically seeded too. I would say um, there was a lot of word of mouth. When you have a good product, it can naturally sell itself a lot mm-hmm. of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but People are creatures of habit. They don't like to change. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a, it can be a hurdle to get people on it and to learn a new system. Um, but I would say the biggest shift that we've seen is um, is people probably taking a step back and taking some more time to really reevaluate what they want out of their company and what of their team. Not not even just like, you know, I mean, look, look at your personal life, I would even say. Like, I think when you're faced with a pandemic, um, when you're faced with mortality, not everyone has had that face to them. Mm-hmm. And I think when that is on your doorstep, people reevaluate, they re they reassess, they say, okay, well, what really matters? Mm-hmm. Where are my values? What, right. how are we going to move this product? You know, how can we, and, that, and that's when ingenuity comes in and that's when you're going to see some really big changes. So I'm excited to see what happens. And yeah. like, I'm excited to see where we've already come, you know. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is a great way for companies to, to pivot and to change their business model to to be a little bit more 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 robust and more um, efficient. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Totally. And we've we've seen that. We've seen teams, like I said, reevaluate. I think they're being innovative through technology while also trying to enable that human experience. Mm-hmm. But it's really um, showing how you know. Re- new real estate is going to be marketed and sold. Mm-hmm. And there's a distinction there. Like we, you know, we have new development in our DNA. That's where we all come from. Um, we're seeing a lot of developers say, you know, like, well, how can, or project marketers or brokerage teams, how can we improve the buyer's experience? Mm-hmm. And we're, you know, at Spark tackling innovation from an aspect of the industry that, you know, publicly not much is known about, but it's also really important. Like mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of things coming down our pipeline that if we build it, we're going to build it properly. And it's, yeah. it's I'm excited to see where 
where that bridge and that gap, like you said, real estate, technology, Vancouver, we're right in the hub of it, where that's going to go. Yeah. So if you're just tuning in, we're here with Kelly Hager of Spark. She's the lead account executive for a real estate software that sells, um, that is just focuses on selling new homes and condos. Um, you mentioned just now new technologies and systems. I'm really curious to know um, what is down the pipeline for for in terms of like just adding a certain tool or um, like you just said, you integrated DocuSign. Um, is there anything that maybe you can kind of hint to us that you guys are working on or maybe other CRMs are kind of trying to introduce into the system? I know Offplan just came in to the game recently yeah. and um, there's been some really good uh, good news on that they've done some deals in that form. Yeah. Um, I think, again, a very good question. I think we are seeing people engage online more. That's pretty standard across the board globally. Mm -hmm. People are looking, they're they're clicking, they're they're visiting websites. Um, tech is enabling a more accurate discovery process. So we're having, you know, a lot of information being thrown out there, but it's how do we get that human connection across still? And, you know, things like, you know, digital online sales, that's great. But if it's done through a credit card, like how accurate really is that, right? Mm, okay. So I think you're seeing a lot of these, again, flavors of the month or the week or the year, Okay. Um, I think it's important and we're seeing people kind of slow down a bit, reassess as well. Um, but also how can we, I think the biggest tool is how can we make the sales experience more humanized? Mm -hmm. How can we still have that human touch, mm -hmm. but utilize, you know, uh, some sort of online digital sales center or marketing aspect of it. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a blend. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's very interesting. Um, how do our listeners reach out to, to you and your company? Yeah, that's a uh, thank you for, for asking. <laughs> How do they contact you? Um, you can check out our website. It's spark.re, S P A R K dot R E as in real estate. Um, you can also reach out to me at kelly at spark.re, my email. I'll answer any questions you might have, or even if you want to go for a glass of wine at a distance, um, give me shoot me an email. I always love meeting people in the industry. I you do have a question. Yeah. Video, uh, video emailing. Because I know that like BombBomb's super famous for it. I've received it from like yeah. mortgage brokers. Actually, I because he sent that, I actually used him as my, one of my for one of my mortgages. Um, but ever since he's done my mortgage, I haven't heard from him anymore. <laughs> um, but if someone is trying to get a hold of someone, like on the phone, they're not picking up, and you know they've kind of exhausted the email route. Do you think video emailing is a good idea? Look, I, I think there's nothing wrong with trying it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're never going to know unless you try. Mm -hmm. I personally, um, I personally would like a, a more concise, like if I've never met you in person or if I've never, it's a bit of a, whoa, but it can be done, yeah. right? Like they, um, Cerebral Selling does a really good thing on how you should always include videos. And mm -hmm. even with Zoom now, I always put my video on mm -hmm. so people can see me, mm -hmm. right? Like I think there is that element of that human connection that people want. So give it a try. I mean, mm -hmm. you'll see if it works or not quite soon and quite quickly. Yeah, I guess. But going back to your point, follow up, right? Follow up so important. And yeah. people just forget that. They, if once nothing they get else it, is working, just might as well keep drawing something, another route, right? For sure. Um, uh, I am very um, intrigued with, with Spark and and everything that it does because it makes my team members job so much easier. It also makes them accountable, right? Oh, absolutely. Like yeah. you're going to know how I many can... calls have made or what who's who's selling what, you know, accountability is pretty big. Yeah. And the developer will notice that and I think just open transparency is nothing but beneficial. Yeah. But yeah, and come check out some UDI events also. Oh, I know absolutely. you're not going to I know you're not going to make the cycle one, but I promise to do it again. <laughs> I, w I was signed up and, and I, th that's why I was like jogging or riding around Stanley Park oh, just to warm up. Oh, look at you go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going from what the, what point is it starting I, at? I tried to make it an easy route. I was okay. like, we're going to start. That was novice. Right? Yeah, it was an, it's the novice. And we're going to focus on proper form. You're not going to be dancing in your seat to music. It's going to be all about, <laughs> you know, slow and steady wins the race. I um, won't tell you that I was doing it in my flip flops then. Oh, you can totally do it in your flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you stopped off somewhere on the seawall for a distant drink at the end of it. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have time for 10 uh, rapid fire them. questions? Lay it on me. Okay, okay. Um, what's your favorite cycling route in Ooh. Vancouver? 
That's a good one. Deep Cove. Only because of Honey's oh. Donuts at the end. Oh, so where do you start? Uh, I typically start somewhere in Vancouver. Uh, I might meet up with friends, sometimes early morning, go over uh, Second that Arrows, mm -hmm. and then uh, you can either do the Seymour Parkway or you can do the Dollarton Highway and go the lower mm -hmm. route, and then you can stop at Honey I like Donuts. that route. I like, I've done the Dollarton route. Yeah, it's a nice, nice one. Yeah. Um, what does creativity mean to you? Uh, being authentic to yourself. Nice. Good. What's an important life lesson for someone to learn? No is okay. Ooh, good. I, I learned I learned the hard way. I just kept saying yes, yes, yes to, I didn't want to turn down business. I think when you're young, it's natural to do that, right? Mm -hmm. I was the same. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, as I've aged, I realized that saying no can be very powerful and hearing no can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, what else have you, where else have you lived besides Vancouver? Oof. That's over a dinner. Um, <laughs> all over. Uh, I actually got into real estate because of my love of traveling and just living in different cities and communities. I spent a year in South Korea in 2010, finished my undergrad in human geography and indigenous governance cool. and history. And with a degree like that, I was like, oh, I guess I could go into law, um, but thought I should uh, travel a bit before that. Yeah. And I did. And quickly fell in love with Seoul and what a crazy woven tapestry of, you know, not only the city makeup, but its transit was crazy. I think like 2010 Seoul was two thirds of Canada's population in one city. And 2010, when I was there, Seoul um, had was more techn technologically advanced as a city in development than probably mm -hmm. Vancouver is today. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, lived in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, traveled all over North America. Um, never been to Europe. That's I have my mm. I have my European citizenship, but I've never been. Oh, really? Yeah, I should probably make it over. That I way. think you should. Well, not right now, but yeah, soon. hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Um, what name a book you you have read that's positively shaped you? Ooh, very good question. Um, Letter to My Daughter by Maya Angelou. I cried when I read it. Okay. I'm admitting I'll it. Pick that I pick uh, Yeah. No, it, it's... What is the next book at the UDI? The next book at UDI is uh, You Want to Talk About Race. Okay, we're, good one. We're cracking it open. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to be a good conversation. Um, what is something you wish you could be good at or you're learning at the moment? Hmm. I know these are rapid fire. I would like to learn how to sing better. You sing already. I, I do. Okay. Yes. But I'd like to learn how to utilize my voice a bit better because it is like any other <laughs> instrument. Um, what makes you laugh no matter what? Dogs and babies. Oh. What is a unique skill you bring to your job? I think I'm, I'm kind of kooky. My team would say that. I've utilized <laughs> it. Everyone's weird. It's about just, you know, harnessing your weirdness and being good at that. Um. I like to have fun. I don't take things too, too seriously. When it's time to be serious, we can be, and we get the work done. But at the end of the day, we have a lot of fun with our team. And I think that's why we, we've attracted the people that we do. And we have such a great work dynamic. Awesome. Um, if you can have any job in the world, what would you do? What would you be doing? My brothers are going to laugh. They called me dog girl growing up. I'd probably be like working on some rescue in a surf camp in Ecuador or something with a bunch of dogs. <laughs> That's if money wasn't like, an option, I sound, sleeping in a hammock. Like I'd be doing that too, but yeah. in Costa Rica. Yeah. <laughs> Anywhere really equatorial, I'm okay with. Um, what are your plans this weekend? I am actually cycling. I didn't plan this. Um, <laughs> Wait, at the beginning of this conversation, you said that you're not much of a cycler. I, I come, uh, yeah. Our family cycles a lot, and I didn't know this till recently. I, again, I'm a history nerd and buff. Um, my great grandpa used to cycle from Iowa um, to Boston and do these great cycling trips. And this was back in like the 1910s, right? Like cars were just coming on the scene, like eight, 1890s. And apparently, he'd go on these like five day cycle excursions. And we'd camp along the way, and his main trick was crushing walnuts with one hand. And he'd get money in a hat for like, I bet you can't, you don't think I can crack this walnut in one hand. And then he would do it, and people would be like, oh, take my money. And then he'd continue driving and get provisions along the way. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, my brother cycles a lot. Uh, I grew up riding bikes, you know, back in the day to find out where the people were at their house. You would just look where the most bicycles were out front. So 
cycling is a great way. It's so much fun. It's freedom. You don't, you're, you're more connected to the scenery around you. So yeah, this weekend I'm actually cycling to Gibson's. Mm -hmm. I have two really good friends, one from university. One of my oldest friends, Benji is living there with his little kid and his partner, Jenna. And we're going to go. And then I have other friends sailing over on their sailboat. We're going to swim in the ocean, drink cider and play some music. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kelly. You've been fantastic. Some really good tips on follow-up calls, on uh, what to do with leads, how to get the leads. Um, one more question. There's so much noise online. There's so much ads going on. There's so much, you know, um, distractions. What is one tip that you can give to a marketing team um, to get the right attention? I think that starts with oneself. So this is probably not the answer you're looking for, but I was going to say unplug for a weekend. You'll approach it with fresh eyes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thanks so much. Talk really a big pleasure. <laughs> Bye.